Brilliant. Um, thanks, Rebecca, for that um, lovely introduction. Um, it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. So I am really delighted that you said such lovely things. Um, I am trying to get this on slideshow. Is that on slideshow? Yes. So much easier than Teams. Um, OK, well, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Rebecca said, I'm, I'm Jane O'Hara. I um, I'm absolutely delighted to um, be able to talk to you a bit about really a sort of retrospective, I guess, about um, some of the work that myself, but also Rebecca, it's fair to say, um, Rebecca and colleagues uh, within the Yorkshire Quality and Safety Research Group have been doing over the past, well, 12 years, 13 years, really, um, where, we're, where we've been building, I think, an evidence base for the involvement of, of patients and families in supporting their safety and the safety of systems. And so I want to kind of talk talk to you about you know the changing roles of, of patients and families how we've sit or rather not that their roles have changed but our understanding of and our recognition of um, those changing roles um, across across the sort of the last decade in particular so um, you might be thinking you know it's obvious isn't it why we should be involving patients in patient safety or everyone talks about patient safety, um, sorry, patient involvement in patient safety now. And, and, and I think that that is right to, to, to certainly a significant extent. Um, but it has, certainly hasn't always been like that. And when Rebecca and I first started out um, on our journey in this, um, in this area in 2010, um, we were kind of lone voices a lot of the time about this. You'd go to a conference and you'd be mentioning things and people would say, oh, we don't want patients telling us about things. That would be like being watched or um, it would be like having a sort of big brother being omnipresent over you. You know, there was a real sort of potentially a mistrust of, of patient involvement in, in safety initiatives um, and, and certainly some questions around the credibility of their, of their witness of, of safety events. So it really hasn't always been as it is now. And so what I want to do is to take you back in time uh, through history and really uh, start to unpick where this movement started, um, what, sh what shaped the movement of patient involvement in patient safety. And in doing so, I want to sort of bring that alive um, through uh, thinking about some of the work that we have done um, across Yorkshire and the things that we have learned about this issue um, during that time. So, um, I want to just say at the beginning, this is a bit of a sort of love fest for the Yorkshire Quality and Safety Research Group. Um, I am talking about the work that we have done um, collectively. At points, I do reflect on um, others' work, but it is unashamedly a bit of a retrospective about our stuff. And I do recognise that this is a community of scholars um, across the world who are building that, some of whom um, are on the call um, today, and I'm delighted to, to have you. OK, so what I want to present today is a totally unscientific categorization um, based on the uh, sort of social history of the patient involvement mo movement. So I will start by talking about what I'm describing as the Dark Ages. So that's pre-2000, um, when uh, the time before uh, patient involvement in, in safety really began. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about the period in the sort of decade between 2000 and, and 2010, when the patient safety movement started in earnest and the involvement of patients uh, and, and, and um, patient and family involvement in safety started to be studied, started to be described. And then we'll move into what I'm describing as the enlightenment. So that's a, a sort of five year period where it really took off as a movement um, and started to be studied in earnest. And then I will come to a time where we sort of broadened and expanded our notion of what it is um, to understand safety, what, what different sort of theoretical lenses we're applying to safety. And in doing so, we're starting to understand perhaps um, the ways, different ways in which patients and families might be supporting system safety and not just allowing us to sort of understand how safe things have been. 
And then finally, I'll move to a sort of time in the future, which I'm describing as the postmodern era, um, and think about what's on the horizon, what's to come potentially uh, in terms of the future of patient, in, um, patient involvement in patient safety um, initiatives and thinking. Okay, so to start then in, in, in this social history of patient involvement, we start at the Dark Ages. So this is pre-2000. It is an era of largely health and safety where things were thought of as slips, trips, falls, needle sting injuries. Safety was often seen much more about um, staff safety than patient safety. It hadn't really been labelled as such necessarily. Um, and certainly in terms of patient involvement in safety, uh, patients were seen as passive recipients of care. Um, but within this, um, within this time, there were things going on to start to uh, sort of create the foundations for the patient safety movement. And this started um, largely due to a series of uh, case note reviews that, that came out of uh, what was called the Harvard Medical Practice uh, Study. Uh, and there was a series of papers and you can go on and have a, have a look at those. Um, but basically it was a time where they started to look back at case notes and say, what is the burden of adverse events? What is the problem of patient safety that we should be uh, looking at and trying to address? And so this study really sort of kicked off, if you like, uh, the patient safety movement um, in earnest. But certainly, again, patient involvement was really not even mentioned or talked about at that, at that point. So moving quickly then into this second era of um, patient involvement. Um, and I'm describing this as the Reformation because in this time, um, we started to see patient safety emerging as a valid concern. It was being named as an issue. There were lots of initiatives that were moving forward as a result of it, some of which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and patients in this era begin to be seen as maybe users of care rather than just recipients of care. Their, their, their agency is starting to be uh, moved forward. So in this phase, um, it was really sort of kicked off in 1999 by this um, report, the publication in the US of To Err is Human. Um, and this report and the one that followed, which was an organization with a memory, which was the UK version, it followed in the, the following year in 2000, it really laid bare, bare the extent of patient safety incidents um, in Western healthcare systems. And it was from the, these reports that the, um, you may have heard it before, that the phrase was born, a jumbo jet a day of people are dying as a result of what was then called iatrogenic harm or medical error. And it was quite a sort of sensationalist term, but what it was trying to do was to attempt um, to describe and make real and visualize um, the burden of harm that uh, is linked to patient safety and uh, what, what was then conceived to be medical error at the time. But in, these in this kind of era, in this phase, um, patients and families were still seen as passive kind of users of care or recipients of care um, that was provided. But what happened quite early in that decade uh, was Charles Vincent and Angela Coulter published what went on to be a really a seminal paper in this area and it really kicked off I think um, the patient involvement movement particularly in academia but then subsequently in healthcare organisations and their angle was quite simple it was as the title suggests it said you know if we're thinking about patient safety what about the patient we should be thinking about the patient why are we not considering them in terms of their involvement in, in, in safety? And, and then in this, this sort of decade period, what you then see is a slight um, emergence of different types of studies that were, that were really taking this on board and saying, okay, can people start to tell us about things that, um, that might indicate that there are, that, that, that patient safety incidents have happened? A lot of this work was based in the US, um, although I've got here uh, David uh, Schrapach, who was based in Switzerland, and he equally did quite a lot of work in this area in that, in that period. But, but, but what, it, what they were saying was, um, yes, patients can and families can tell us about things um, that have happened. But what's really interesting about this time is it was largely these, these um, studies were largely undertaken by medics. And so their angle was, 
can patients tell us about things and can and is that information credible so what they would do is to say let's go away and as medics we will say whether this is or isn't a patient safety incident um, very much still in that sort of medical model of clinical governance or or a corroboration of of what patients and families were telling us but also in this time um, is uh, came out a paper by Henri and Pratt. And if you've not seen this paper, I would really urge you to go and read this paper because it is as true now as it was then. And it really helped me, I think, understand what it was that we were trying to do with our work on, on patient involvement in patient safety. Um, and that is because of this quote. So they said, patients are the only actors physically present during every treatment and consultation event. And this makes patients uniquely positioned to observe, understand and monitor their overarching disease trajectory as it unfolds over time. So when you think about this in the context of health services, that means that they are the only people present at every single, pres uh, every single presentation that they may um, make within um, a healthcare setting, at every different appointment, at every different exchange and interaction, unless of course they're unconscious or, or otherwise unwell, but certainly they will be there and conscious and available as witness to ongoing care. And this really, really influenced both myself and I know, uh, I know my colleague um, Rebecca as well, in the sense of, that we started to understand that patients were really, patients and their families were really sort of the, could be a really untapped resource, I think, in terms of understanding safety. So moving on then to the, what I'm describing as the period of enlightenment. So that is the, the era between 2010 and 2015. And in this era, it's fair to say patient safety came of age. There was a proliferation of funding. There was many, many more papers. There was much more activity in policy um, around patient safety. But in the context of patient involvement, what we see is a move towards more recognition that patients have legitimate information that, can, um, that we can gather as organizations that can help us understand um, the safety of our care. And it was in this era that my journey in patient safety began. I started at the Bradford Institute on a very snowy day in January 2010. Um, and I came to work with uh, Jerry Armitage, but also Rebecca Lawton, who just in the previous two years started up the Yorkshire Quality and Safety Research Group. And in 20, uh, 2008, um, Rebecca had headed up uh, with John Wright, a programme of work which was trying to establish the ways in which patients could tell us about things um, that were related to safety and whether this information could be used to improve services. So I wanted to give due recognition uh, to Rebecca as somebody who, having worked with James Reason um, through her PhD, has always been very influenced by this model, the organisational accident model. And this is a theory which states that if you can identify factors that contribute to safety events, that actually you can try to then seek to change those factors and reduce the likelihood of um, those events happening again. So it was this kind of framing, it was this lens that was really shaping our early work in patient involvement. And what it led to was us to ask two key things. And that was, can patients tell us about things um, that can help us understand how safe we are? And then importantly, can it help us improve the, uh, the safety of our systems? So coming to the first uh, question, can patients tell us things that can help us understand how, safety we, uh, how safe we are? Um, well, based on the fact that some work had been done in the previous decade, um, the first thing I did when I started work was to do a systematic review. And we looked at um, the, um, the extant um, empirical evidence, so what was known in the scientific literature around this question, and we found, yes, patients can tell us about things in a hospital setting that are related to safety and can potentially then be used um, for service improvement. But um, there were some really interesting things linked back to what I said about the earlier issue of it being largely driven prior to this point, 
particularly by medics who'd been writing about this phenomenon. There were issues around the ongoing issues, I think, around the credibility of patients' witness of these events, their ability to understand things that have happened, and importantly, their ability to identify possible reasons for why something has happened. There was definitely not that much evidence out there at that time to show that that was the case. And what I was also able to demonstrate was the fact that much of the work that had been done to that point um, was done in the research domain. So we knew that we that you know if you go out and you send researchers out there, that people will tell you about things. But what we didn't know was whether that could be uh, developed into something which then organisations could use and then potentially use that um, to shape through that feedback to shape the systems and the safety of their of their services. So the programme of work, it was a five year programme gone, and I don't have time to uh, tell you um, all um, about that. Um, but this was the main sort of climax of all of that work. And it was the um, largest randomised controlled trial at the time, I think it probably still is, um, of an intervention which was specifically designed to gather um, patient safety reported incidents from patients um, and use this information to try and improve services. And as part of that work, we were able to gather the largest data set at that time. And again, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure uh, to what extent that's been exceeded, but it was the largest data set at the time of patient safety reported, sorry, patient reported safety concerns. So things that people who were receiving care in hospital told us about their care in terms of the safety of that care. And we found a few really important things. And one of those things was that when you ask people about their concerns and their safety concerns, the number of those concerns that are then classified uh, through a clinician um, um, going through the reports and, and saying, does this meet the criteria of a patient safety incident? Um, the number of those concerns classified as a patient safety incident actually mirrors exactly the long-term estimates of harm that have been identified. So that is one in 10, around one in 10 of patients identified a patient safety incident during their inpatient stay. So we see an extraordinary sort of mirroring really um, of other forms of error detection. So that's case note review um, and complaints and things like that. It was coalescing around this sense that around about 10% of people were experiencing something and they were able to tell us about that. But when you look at what they are telling us, it becomes even more interesting because not only are they telling us things um, which could be considered to be harm events, and in, on this graph here, um, that's in the darker grey. Um, so those incidents that were reported against these types of um, issues, um, the darker grey was where they were classified, classified as a patient safety incident. The lighter grey is where they weren't classified as a patient safety incident. So you can see that across a broad range of issues, they're, they're, they're able to give us information which would be classified as patient safety incidents. But equally, they're giving us a whole bunch of other stuff that even if it doesn't meet the threshold for a patient safety incident, they're, they're giving us lots of information about things which we could say are potential contributory factors to future harm. So when you think about it, not only are they telling us they're reporting to us patient safety incidents, they're also reporting factors that might contrib contribute to future patient sa safety events. And in that sense, then, they are a real source of safety critical data for organisations. And this becomes even more compelling a story when you consider that actually that information that they're giving us is not duplicated. And really early on when we started this work, um, one of the things that I used to get, and I'm sure Rebecca did the same, was, yes, but we can get this from other sources, can't we? It will come through PALS, it will come through complaints, it will be there in the case notes. And so as part of this programme of work, we did a study to answer exactly that question. So we took an earlier form of, um, uh, we took some data from an earlier um, study within this program, and uh, we took all the patient safety, uh, the patient reported safety incidents, and we classified 
all of the incident, uh, all of the reports as whether they were a patient safety incident or not. And then we took the ones that had been classified, i.e. those are the ones that we might expect to be in other sources of, of error um, intelligence or safety intelligence. And then we looked across the other things that might have picked that up. So we were able to, through the, the, the patient number, to actually track where they'd gone, the time frame where they'd been in the hospital, and then look at the other forms of data um, of sources of intelligence. So in this sense, in this case, that was PALS, which is um, patient advisory liaison service, I think it's called. Um, so that's where people might go to say, I've got a complaint. Um, we looked at staff incident reporting systems, and we also undertook a case note review of those of the uh, the case notes of the people who'd reported a safety concern to us. And what you can see from this is that of 121 patient safety patient reported patient safety incidents, only do my maths now. Seven of those were actually evident in other forms. So we know that this is not duplication. We know that actually patients and families are giving us a unique insight actually into safety concerns. So it's not just that patients are telling us about one in 10, they're potentially telling us about different things. And that makes it really important to speak to them. So I think I've given you the hard sell in terms of what people can tell us. The really enticing prospect then is, okay, so if we give this information back to staff on wards and we use that as part of an action planning process, will it improve system safety? Well, as probably is predictable, it's a complicated picture. Um, Rebecca, as you can see, published um, the results of this big trial. Um, and what we found is when, we, when we'd measured this intervention where we'd gathered all of this data from patients, we'd fed that back to staff, we'd sat with them in action planning, we tried to support making improvements based on this feedback from patients and families. We then measured that against uh, two measures of, of safety. One was what's called the patient safety thermometer data. So in the UK, that means um, information about things like pressure ulcers. It's an index of certain safety events that then get pulled and put into what's called a thermometer. So we measured that against that. Um, and then we also measured it against patient reported safety. And the intervention found no effect on other, either outcome, which I think we were disappointed about, but we also recognise that this was an incredibly complex intervention in an incredibly complex system that it was going into. And actually that, you know, maybe the RCT is not the best way to try and look at these complex questions, because what we found from the qualitative work that we did around it, <clears throat> excuse me, was that patients can and did provide feedback, but also really importantly that staff valued that feedback for improvement and that they use that feedback to try and make improvements. So even if we couldn't establish with the slightly difficult, tricky measures that we used to assess whether um, at scale it was making a difference, what we knew when we spoke to people is, what, is that it was making a difference. So it is a complicated picture, I think. Um, and so fresh from our disappointment that we found no effect, uh, we started to think about um, different ways of thinking about uh, patient involvement in patient safety. And so we arrive at the area of modernity. And it's in this era that really patient safety is widening its lens. And our take on this in this era is that actually patients and families, we're recognizing their role as being, it's moving beyond just simply reporting safety events to us, but actually we're starting to recognize their role as what we call co-creators of safety. So we're starting to recognize that they do things all the time that contribute not just to their safety, but also potentially the system level performance of safety. Um, but before I go into talking about that, I just want to recognize that um, for many of you, um, 
you know, we're, we're all still grappling, I think, with some of these changes um, that we're seeing in the approaches that people are using uh, to think about safety. And the most important shift, I think, in this period has been uh, a movement away from more linear models of safety um, to actually to approaches which advocate um, you know, trying to understand healthcare systems in all of their complexity and how those, those systems deliver safe performance every day, not just thinking about um, the times when they don't deliver safety performance. And so just to underline that, um, I'll just give you two, um, two diagrams just so that you can hold these things, hold this um, diagram in your mind as I'm going through into the next section, because really how I conceive, and actually it's not really, these are Eric Holnagel's diagrams, they're not mine, um, but how I think about, uh, about Safety One is that actually we're managing by snapshots. So we're not thinking really about how the system is usually performing and under what conditions. Um, we're thinking about those rare times where actually things breach what we consider to be acceptable levels of performance. And then we go into the system at that point and we say, what's happened there? And we make a judgment about the ongoing um, capability of the system or about ongoing performance of the system. What safety two does is to actually say, let's not be quite as worried, moral, moral, moral issues aside, and uh, that's a whole other different discussion. But actually, if you're looking to understand the safety of a system, what you actually want to do is to look at everyday performance. You want to say, how is the system managing itself and managing its own performance um, by supporting its ability to actually be retained within those boundaries of, of acceptable performance? How do we get, how do things go right most of the time? And so that's just hold these images in your head as I'm talking through the next section, because um, what we started to then think about related to, to concepts like safety too, was really to think about how patients and families might be viewed slightly differently in the context of safety. Um, and actually, rather than just being seen as people that create variation in the system, so people you know, don't take their medication or people uh, don't adhere to treatment guidance or they smoke before an operation or they do all of those sorts of things. Actually, what we also need to recognize, uh, recognize is the input that they have, which actually contributes to their safety. And what we started to sort of frame that as is that patients and families, in effect, through this sorts of behavior, scaffold the, the, the activity of services. They help to create the outcomes that we see um, in our services. And so based on this sort of framing, which was conjecture at the time, um, we set out to study this exact thing. We, so we had a series of research questions um, of which these were the two main ones really. Um, and those were, do patients and families have a role in supporting their own safety? And then do patients and their families have a role through this role? Do they support system level resilience or the performance of um, the safety performance of systems at a sort of service or organizational level? So in terms of the first question, I think it's really now you know, well documented that actually patients and families do loads of things which support their safety. They might chase GP appointments. They might correct errors um, when they see them on their records or say, this tablet is brown, I normally get a red one. Um, they might go to the pharmacy to say, actually my medicines have changed. Can you talk me through that and, and make sure that any sort of safety issues are ironed out? But the bigger question I think then, given that that's been documented is, does this support actually contribute to more than just supporting their safety? Is it all adding up to contribute to something bigger than that, which is that actually it's buoying up our systems and the safety of those systems, if you like? Should we be conceiving patients and families in having a role in supporting system level resilience? And so we had this as a hunch, and, um, and to try and uh, ask this question, uh, we undertook a large 
programme of work. And we wanted to do that in a, what we know is a particularly risky area in terms of safety. And that's the transition for older people from um, an acute admission into hospital um, to their home um, or, or, or their usual place of dwelling. Um, and so to understand this whole process of how people move from being in hospital back home, we, we did a number of things. So we spoke to um, a range of different staff um, across all the disciplines that were involved in this, practice staff, general practice staff, community staff, of course, people in, in the hospital. And we also did um, focused observations of transitions and the discharge process. But one of the really exciting things that we did uh, was to speak to older people. We literally consented them um, in hospital and then we followed up with them over a period of time after they'd been discharged, going to their homes or speaking to them on the phone to really understand what their experience was, what they were doing when they were discharged and how that might relate to um, their safety. And then what we did was to try and bring this, all of this and it was a big data set, all of this together. Um, so we did that using the, what we called a function. So <clears throat> I've got a little bit of a croak in my throat, so I'm just going to take some water. Because this is hard to say. So um, we did what's called a FRAM or the functional resonance analysis method. And um, for those of you, which probably will be most of you, um, who haven't had the uh, luxury of, of doing this because it takes a long time, it's basically a way of modelling the system that helps you to articulate and to describe functional activity. And what that means is that it's not about what tasks people are supposed to do. Um, that you might see in a normal process mapping exercise. So X person writes this sheet and then Y person does that. Actually, it's about saying <clears throat> what they actually do. What is the function of the work that they are achieving? So um, when you look at it like that, what does transition look like? Well, it looks like this. Um, this is our estimation of it and it took us probably a few years off our lives, uh, the, the three of us that did this to get to this point. But on the left here, what you can see is the admission to a base ward in a hospital, and it runs all the way through to the right hand side, um, th with the gap in between being when people have um, moved over and been discharged uh, back into the community. And so what we were able to describe in functional terms were was the type of activity that happens in the hospital. Um, and what we saw was a lot of that activity, I think in terms of supporting discharge and of other, a lot of that activity was to support discharge, not necessarily to prepare people to get home, but that's something that I will pick up again in a, mo in a moment. We then saw that there were lots of prescribed functions for patients. So there were bits that you would hand over to the patient in terms of to take home medications and some information, um, although that's very variable, um, about their condition and, and, and things that they need to attend to. Um, but also there was a, an official handover of some patients to general practice or to community services for follow up. And so where there was that um, where that, there was that handover, there were um, then some general practice functions, things that uh, people based in general practice were doing to support people when they were at home. And then there were some specified community functions, and that was particularly for people who had wraparound um, care um, that had been agreed before they left. But what was really interesting we hadn't expected to see was that there was some, there was some activity the patients, and I don't know why I didn't expect to see it, but we didn't expect to see it so crystal clear. That there were some activities that patients were undertaking that created, um, that were effectively safety functions for them to keep them at home and to stop them being readmitted and to get them well and, and, get, uh, and, and make sure that they're safe. And just to unpick that a little bit more. So what do we mean by patient functional activity? Well, things like, managing their take-home medications. So there's a bunch, massive, some people, massive bag of take-home medications, they've got to get to grips with it. Some of it will have been changed from before. Some of it will be new to them. So they've got to get to grips with it. They're, they're going to be possibly frail. They're certainly going to be in a worse 
condition than they went into hospital. Um, and, and, you know, so it's not a, a small task to manage that. And then once you've gone through your take home medication, do you then have to do things like getting new medications from the prescriptions that you have um, the, through the community pharmacy? And you have to make sure that's timely. You have to make sure that you understand exactly how to take those medications and so on and so forth. And then they've got to manage their health and well-being. If you think about these things as things that were effectively clinical activity before they got discharged two days previously or whenever it was, they've got to manage themselves. They've got to eat right. They've got to sleep right. They've got to um, you know, feed themselves the right things. They've got to take their medication. They've got to get out. They've got to engage in social activities. They've got to do all of those things. They've got to move around, they've got to toilet themselves, they've got to do all of those things which actually, again, for lots of these frail older people, were taken away from them. They're not necessarily allowed to toilet themselves, they're not necessarily allowed um, to get up and get around because they're a fool's risk, for example, but suddenly they're discharged and they have to do that. But one of the most profound things that really changed the way that we thought about this was that they have a functional activity of knowing when to escalate their care. And it's something that we really hadn't thought about before. But of course, why, like, it's an enormous, it's an enormous factor when we're thinking about readmissions, like people knowing when to come back into hospital, when to seek other care is a clinical activity. Knowing when to do that, when your symptoms are bad enough, the sorts of things that you need to look out for, it's a clinical activity. And so when you think about it, what we were doing was essentially handing over to the patient at the point of discharge, a whole bunch of activity, which was previously clinically determined and managed. And so when you think about that in terms of the, the fact that within hospitals, we often shut down risk and we don't allow people to toilet themselves and we don't allow people to practice taking their medication or self-medicate and we don't allow people um, the time and I, I, I totally take the degraded nature of the system so this isn't a dig this is a system level issue um, we don't give people sufficient time to really understand their condition and to be able to manage that going forward um, so actually we're handing stuff over at a time when we've taken it all away previously in hospitals so with our intervention, what we wanted to do was to support this functional downstream activity. Initially, we wondered whether it would be a discharge intervention, but actually what we wanted to do was to say, it can't be about discharge. It has to be about supporting people to practice at home, sorry, in hospital for being at home, because it was that bit that was missing. Um, so we developed an intervention. Um, we call it a booklet, it's probably underselling it a little bit. It's, it's a sort of set of prompt things around things like taking medication, understanding your condition um, and moving. Uh, and that feed, fits in nicely with things like deconditioning uh, practice and all of that sort of stuff. There's a short film and, then, and what we tried to do um, was to, to also institute a patient-friendly care summary. Um, and the really exciting thing about this is that we are trialing this currently um, in 11 trusts across um, the region um, and the north and hopefully at some stage we'll be able to bring you some of those results. Okay so in my final few minutes I'm going to talk a little bit about the postmodern so the future for patient involvement in patient safety and in this what I want to sort of just throw in to the mix is the idea of if we can appreciate and understand that patients and families have a role as co-creators of their safety and of safe hit systems. Should we be expanding now to say all of us as citizens, as members of the public, actually co-create the safety of our healthcare systems? And to, to say this, you know, we're, we're starting to think about this, but we do have some emergent evidence for this. And, um, and one of the really great examples I'm sure all of you will be able to understand and, 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 and would resonate with you is in the last few years during COVID, um, 
there has been enormous reorganizations of society, but particularly of healthcare services. And the expectations of people about what healthcare is, what it can deliver, and what their role is in um, making sure that, that, that the health services can deliver that has completely changed in lots of ways, certainly within the UK. And so we wanted to ask a question at that important time to say, what is the role of the public in contributing to healthcare system resilience? So what we did, was to set up a longitudinal study in that first phase of the um, pandemic. So I think we started in about April, no, May 2020, and we ran through to the to autumn 2020. And we interviewed people over three occasions to really understand, and these weren't patients necessarily, we just asked anybody, members of the public over social media, questions about what they were doing with respect to their safety and the safety of their healthcare decisions. And sure enough, we saw that they were doing lots of things which were explicitly to uh, support health services. And the first thing is to say that suddenly all of us were making decisions about what was serious enough to seek help. We were all making escalation decisions all the time. Um, we were thinking, I've got the sniffles. Is this COVID? Shall we go and get a test? Um, do I need an oximeter um, to test my SATs just in case I need to go into hospital? Um, you know, I think, I think it's fair to say, and we can all think about things that we did um, that were essentially clinical activity to, to say, do we need to seek care or not? Because if we don't, we need to stay away. We need to protect the NHS. We need to save lives. And so people were constantly monitoring the environment and they were making trade-offs about these decisions. And these decisions had profound consequences, not just for them, but for the health system at the time. So there was, you know, signs outside the hospital saying, if you're not ill, stay away. You know, we were being told not to come to hospital. But then, of course, whilst that was protecting people potentially in the short term, we're now seeing the effects of that in the long term. So we know that those things mattered at the time, but they also mattered in different ways over time in in the long term and we're seeing now significant issues in our services around things like um, increased um, diagnosis of cancer at late later stages because people have not presented earlier and that was because we were making as a society that trade-off between the short-term um, decisions around safety um, at the expense of the long term. And when we started thinking about what all this meant, I was reflecting on some work that I'd read a long time ago um, that my colleague Glenn uh, Robert put me onto, which is by this wonderful lady, Eleanor Orstrom, who many of you may know. And if you haven't, I'd recommend going and reading her books. I've got one on my shelf there. Um, and what she has talked about a lot is about societies and groups of people and how they organize themselves and make uh, and make sense of the world and in 1978 she wrote this paper and it's so it is so old it's literally written in typeface there um and it was about how um the police um policing and the performance of policing is affected by what citizens do so um she was basically saying that public services are affected by what the public do and so when we think about this in terms of policing, we think people, we lock our doors, we have brilliant locks and the police will come around to tell us what we should have. Um, if we witness a burglary, we get on the phone, you know, we've got neighborhood watch and we'll say, you know, something's happening over there, you need to get down there. And so criminal activity and the rates of arrests and the, the performance of, uh, of the police is effectively co-produced with the people who are paying for it, but also across that society. So if we think about it in the terms, you know, other people have been thinking about this before. We've thought about it in terms of other public agencies and services. Um, what might this mean? Because this would be a big shift, I think, for, um, for involvement and the conception of involvement. What might this mean for us as researchers and as healthcare community. But it might be that actually we think about pre-hospital information and we are seeing that in some services, maternity, we're seeing uh, learning disability, people learning disabilities having um, certain information that they take into hospital with them. Um, but certainly they may be populations that we want to work with more in that way. This was Rebecca's idea years ago and I still think it would be a really good one to look at. We need to work in schools 
we need to not just be telling them about how political system works, we need to be telling them about how their health system works and how to navigate these systems because they're not that easy to navigate and it's their right as future citizens, well as currently citizens, but as future taxpayers to, to actually understand how to use that successfully. And a real plea, I think, is, is to think about how people enter into systems, enter into the healthcare services, not just about what they do when they're into the, in those services. Um, so Rebecca's come online to show me that I need to, to wind this up, but I, I think I've got a couple more, I've just got a couple more slides, so all on time, I think. Okay, so as I close my talk, um, you know, I hope I've convinced you through looking back that we've come a long way. Um, we've really come a long way, but there is, you know, some way to go. Um, and I present to you on that basis, very short manifesto, easily done. Um, and it's to say a few things. So patients and families are a crucial source of safety critical data. And, and really importantly, that's not duplicated in other sources. Stories are powerful, we know this, but it's not the only thing that can contribute to safety improvement or safe performance. Um, we need as a society to admit that public and patients uh, contribute to our system performance and it's not a failing, it is actually a necessary reality of creating systems that are resilient. Um, and this role then needs to actually be supported if it's to be useful. And finally, for the academics in the room, I would say, let's not forget to look back let's not reinvent the wheel let's look to theories that have gone before and people that have written before to try and make sense of this ever increasing complexity that we see in healthcare and i'd just like to say thank you to my colleagues in the YQSR for supporting us all in this work and that's it thank you Well, thank you so much, Jane, for that incredibly insightful overview of, uh, you know, uh, more than 15 years of, of work now and taking us through the history of patient safety, but at the same time, um, really helping us to understand where patients involvement in that um, in that uh, journey has has been and, and what it how's it how it's changed the, the bends and, and turns in the in the road, if you like. Um, so I, we do have one question in the chat um, and some positive, very positive feedback as, as well, Jane. So um, you might want to go and have a look at that. And I know that you'll be able to very easily answer the question. So I'm going to, uh, to, to pose it to you straight away. So it's from Liz. One of the things I'm currently looking at is patient involvement in escalating care in hospital and the difficulties that patients face in doing this. I wondered if you have any thoughts on why this is particularly challenging and what could be done to improve it. And then Joanne Hughes suggests the people that she might want to talk to. She's already uh, read that read that work. And she's saying that we're finding that there are real relational uh, efforts needed by staff to encourage patients to seek help if they feel they're getting worse. And I know this is something that you've uh, certainly engaged with as an issue, Jane, so I wondered if you might have something to say about that. Well, we we, we do have something to say about that, don't we, Rebecca, because we've been trying to look at the issue, issue of escalation um, for a while, and it's come out of a sort of international focus on this, really. We know that there have been um, efforts in the UK, in the US and in Australia to create systems, things like call for concern, um, where people receiving care in hospital um, or their families can effectively press a button, not literally, but figuratively, to say, actually, can we have an outside view of, of, of myself or this person? Um, and so it's a really intuitive idea um, that actually it should be a sort of um, another buffer in the in, in, our, in our systems to try and support managing patient deterioration. I think we, <clears throat> as researchers, were quite interested early on to say um, that these systems need evaluating and you need to evaluate them not just from a, a, a point of view of where people have done it um, and it's turned out to be true, but also then to understand um, how many people might do it, but where actually there's 
you know, actually that, that they're not deteriorating and there is no cause for concern. Um, and so we instituted a lot of work, didn't, haven't we, um, around uh, trying to understand how patients' views of their own wellness actually correlates to other objective signs physiological signs or other signs that, that we might take um, at observations. And there are some really intriguing links uh, that might suggest that, that, that they could add to what we currently um, do in the way of managing deterioration. But I think Joe's point is absolutely right, that the, any system that we have for escalation sits within a so socio-technical system and that people simply having the information is not enough. We know this from things like news scores. We know that simply getting to a threshold on a news doesn't necessarily mean that escalation is going to happen. Escalation is a, is a human reaction to data. Um, and so whatever we do um, with escalation systems, we do need to, um, to recognise that actually particularly staff need to be able to give credibility to the people that are, um, that are putting forward um, this information and their concerns to be escalated. So I think it's a really interesting area. I don't think we know everything that we need to know about it. Um, I certainly think it's an area for further research and, and hopefully over time we're going to be doing more on that. Thanks so much for that response, Jane. Do, do if you've if something's coming to mind, pop, pop any questions uh, in chat. But the next one is uh, from Jackie, who um, rightly says that preparing patients for activities of daily living in their home environment used to be or st still is potentially an occupational therapist task. Um, if this isn't being done, is that because the staff shortages impacting on this? Uh, well, I probably would defer to some of my colleagues on the call uh, who are, are looking at this in more detail. But I... I think, I think it's. I think what we need to think about when we think when we think about what happens in different parts of a health service is because it's the our different approaches to risk management. So, in wards, what we do is because we're measured on falls, we stop people mobilising because we're concerned about falls, and rightly so. That you know, it makes a lot of sense. It can be very serious for people. But the flip side of that is then people become deconditioned and then we then have to sort of send in satellite people to then have an activity of treatment to recondition them when actually the whole time um, all of the systems on wards, you know, we catheterize people that probably don't need to be catheterized to, to reduce falls um, risk and things like that. So actually it's almost like any any sort of satellite involvement by people like OTs, it's like swimming upstream, you know, because actually the rot is setting in, not because OTs aren't available on the ward, but actually that the predominant one is of stopping mobility because it's to reduce risk. And I think that was the biggest thing that came out of our transitions work was to say, you've got these clashes of cultures, haven't you, between the community and inpatient wards. Um, and that is basically the, the, the patient is getting mixed up in that in that clash um, because they're being having their risk reduced in hospital and their risk amplified as a result of that when they get home. So I think there is issues around resource, but I, I think it's more for me an overarching issue around approach to risk, appetite for risk, what services think they're doing a good, a good job in. And if they think they're doing a good job in reducing falls, and that's what they're going to do. That would be my answer to that question. Fantastic, Jane. Just going to ask one more. Now, Jenny Murray's put a really interesting question in the chat, but as you can talk to Jenny anytime, um, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Rebecca um, uh, to, to ask her question, Rebecca Myers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. I suppose um, my question was about how might systems thinking be limiting our ability to understand the complexity of healthcare and reducing the risk of harm? Because it, it forces us to think in certain ways about what is going on, set some boundaries around it. Um, some of the assumptions around causality that you pointed to in your, your picture. And I suppose 
given that we're really emphasizing in healthcare about systems thinking, I'm wondering where complexity theory might help us a bit more to understand some of what's happening. Very much so. And I think um, in the work that I've described around the transitions, that was our lens. Um, we, you know, the, the sort of approaches to resilient healthcare come from complexity thinking. And it's it was, I think, really um, evident in the fact that when we mapped something, we completely changed potentially the focus of our intervention from being something which was at the point of discharge and supporting discharge to actually the activity that was happening during admission. Um, and that was in recognition of the downstream effect of this upstream activity. Um, so we, you know, I think in that respect, and, and, and interestingly, and Jenny, who we've mentioned um, is program manager for that work. And, uh, you know, and, and when we go out and talk to people about it, Jenny always says, people totally get that, they totally understand an intervention which is based on a really good understanding of the complexity of how healthcare is delivered. It speaks to them, their experience and their language. And in that sense, it really adds to the face validity, the ecological validity of some of this stuff. Whether you can do it or not is another thing entirely. And I'm, we, we, we're, we're really hopeful that during a pandemic, we've been able to deliver an intervention which um, may see an effect, but we certainly will have learned a lot through that program, even if our RCT fails to be the right um, design for that in the, in the end. Thank you so much. I think we'll finish on that note. And to, also to say, Jane's never afraid of a challenge. So, um, uh, you know, some of these are very complex and difficult uh, issues to address, but uh, she's always up for, for giving them a go. So thank you so much. Um, I think a round of applause to finish with, if that's okay. And thank you all for joining us today. Look out for our next seminar and we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much, Jane. Thank you.